Welcome to APA's weekly webinar series. My name is Billy Zadig, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to the APA webpage later this afternoon. You will receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the webpage where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through April 2020 and are open for registration now. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by one of the presenters. Professional continuing education credits and AIA CLUs are being offered. For AIA certificates, please send me an email at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at ABBA.org with your membership number. Also, to request a certificate, uh, the continuing education certificate, if you didn't, did not indicate you wanted one when you registered, just send me an email. Also, if you have more than one person attending this session from a central location, please contact me so everyone gets credit for attending. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this webinar over to Brandon and Mark. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you so much, Billy. Good afternoon, it's great to be here. Uh, Brandon and I are really excited to present to you this afternoon and talk to you about our new Grounds Guide, the third edition. It's a sneak preview of what we'll be showing you uh, next year when it comes out for publication. Uh, next slide. And the next. So Brandon and I uh, have been working together for about a year and a half on this book uh, and um, have done a lot of work finding the proper authors, taking input from folks in APA and outside APA to put together what we feel are going to be very ex a very exciting grounds guide. My name is Mark Fournier. I'm the arborist and horticulturalist that trustees of reservations, my toy Japanese garden in Chappaquiddick, which is on Martha's Vineyard, for those of you who don't know, which is an island off the coast of Massachusetts. It's a pretty amazing retirement job, I have to tell you. I'm the M an MBA graduate of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where I had concentrations in environmental management and organizational behavior. I'm a Massachusetts certified arborist, the lead accredited uh, green buildings professional, and a member of the USDA Forest Service Urban Forest Strike Team um, that helps in disasters. I have extensive experience in arboriculture, landscape design, sustainability, energy efficiency, building construction, recycling, organics diversion, materials management, public works, and facilities management. Next. Um, as far as my higher ed experience, I'm the former assistant director for grounds management at UMass Amherst. I spent 28 years there. Uh, it's where I really cut my teeth and where my heart still is. I love that school. I was also the director of plant operations and sustainability at LaSalle College in Newton, Mass, just west of Austin. I taught, also taught sustainable operations management courses as an adjunct professor at UMass Boston College of Management graduate MBA program. Um, and the thing that's really uh, important for me and, and it's been really rewarding for me is I've been in, involved with APA for over 20 years and I've been involved in all three editions of the Grounds Guide and co-authored the sustainable operations chapters of the second edition of the Grounds Book. Next. And uh, I'm Brandon Rux, the Assistant Director of Building and Landscape Services at the University of Chicago. I uh, started here in 2010. I came from the golf industry originally. I'm my uh, undergrads in turf science from Purdue. Um, and just recently, uh, about six months ago, I took over a bit larger portfolio, so along with grounds and athletic fields and everything that kind of comes with that. I also oversee the, um, the staff that take care of janitorial, pest control, waste recycling, elevators, um, and faculty exchange, which is uh, the inner office mail. Um, love facilities so much that I got a master's in facilities um, and a CEFP through, through APA. Um, and with that, uh, Mark's gonna take you through the, the first half of this presentation.
Great. So the first thing we wanted to do this afternoon is give you some background about the trilogy. About 30 years ago, the demand for increased budget cuts uh, reached seismic proportions on campuses. I remember this. I was at UMass. Our, our cuts were incredibly deep. Um, facilities managers scrambled for assistance to validate their staffing requirements and importantly, uh, decide what the impact of budget cuts would be on the levels of service. APA members and campus facility managers became, began discussions about the need for a series of documents that would explain the need for staffing facility operations and the implications of various levels of staffing on levels of service. In other words, you just couldn't cut the budget and expect the same level of service. It was going to impact what the campus looked like and the services that were provided to the customers. And so were born the APA custodial facilities and grounds operational guidelines. Next. So a um, little bit of background about the timelines. Uh, APA's Custodial Staffing Guidelines for Educational Facilities was published in 1992. That's when the project began. And then it was updated and expanded in a second edition published in 1998. APA's Operational Guidelines for Grounds Management, which I was involved in back in the early days, was published in 2001. And then the Maintenance Staffing Guidelines for Educational Facilities for Buildings was published in 2002. And then in 2011, the new and improved operational guidelines for educational facilities, at that time, we began to call it the trilogy for custodial grounds and maintenance um, were published in 2011. There are some central themes that flow through um, all the books and they include staffing guidelines, sustainability, benchmarking, position descriptions, use of commuter, uh, computerized maintenance uh, management systems, CMMS systems, and outsourcing options. The revisions to these books have been based on input from APA surveys from you and others, from our business partners, and from others outside of APA, and also from the task force members who have been involved in these projects, um, either in this year or over the, over the decades. Chapters have been added, edited or deleted based on input from all of these sources. The Apple operational guidelines have become indispensable resource documents for proactive higher education leaders and others seeking to provide state-of-the-art, efficient, and highly effective services on campuses and organizations across the world. Uh, when I was a DPW director, we actually looked, uh, even though it was in higher education, we looked to APA resources um, to help operate our um, our departments, and they were really helpful even in those arenas. Um, an overview, we were asked to give an overview of the second edition's operational guidelines. So this is what was included in the 2011 books, uh, sustainable, uh, the, uh, the 2011 grounds book, sorry. So the chapters included sustainable grounds operations, green fuels, vehicles, and equipment, designing a successful grounds management organization, broadcast and zone approaches, landscape inventory and measurement, ground staffing guidelines, contracting options, benchmarking your organization, snow removal, and position descriptions for the green industry. Next. Um, so what we wanted to do today is to give you an in-depth overview now of the third edition of APA's Grounds Operational Guidelines for Educational Facilities, which, uh, as I said before, Brandon and I have been working on for about a year and a half with a whole variety of uh, authors uh, from all over our uh, industry. Our topics for this edition were selected from recommendations from the surveys we talked about and from other data collected from APA members and experts in the grounds industry. Um, we wanted to put this slide in because as many of you know, um, probably the major driver today uh, for what we do in, in both the grounds operations in our lives is climate change. It's something that's unprecedented and hasn't been seen to this degree uh, ever. So um, basically, if you look at the 2018 report from the IPCC, um, it's going to indicate that 
uh, we have just over a decade to change the course of global emissions to avoid catastrophe. And I personally believe we probably have less time than that. Because climate change issues have become more dire, and because much of the work we do as grounds managers impacts or is impacted by climate change issues, we've included the sustainability discussions and recommendations wherever we can in all our chapters in the third edition. So the third edition chapters include um, two major categories. Um, operational strategies is the first one, and the chapters in that air arena include green roofs, invasive pests and pathogens, integrated pest management, modern technology and its impact on campus maintenance and our operations, natural grass athletic fields, synthetic turf systems, snow and ice operations, sustainable vehicles, equipment, fuels, and lubricants. And the next section Sorry that this is a little slow. Um, we looked at the, the arenas that affect our staff. So um, broadcast maintenance or zone maintenance, which is best for your grounds operation organization. That was written by Brandon. Uh, ground staffing guidelines, leadership, how to write the perfect position descriptions for the green industry, contracting for equipment and services, and grounds maintenance, innovation and improvement. Next. The third edition includes concrete, practical, and real-world examples of strategies and products grounds managers can use to make their organizations more efficient, cutting-edge, sustainable, both financially and environmentally. We wanted to give you real data and real information about programs you can put on the ground tomorrow. We've been assembled an impressive group of authors from the educational, public, and private sectors who possess a wealth of knowledge that will help you improve and grow your organizations and who are passionate about the topics we're talking about. Next. So um, the first chapter we wanted to give you some information on is uh, called Modern Technology and Its Impact on Campus Maintenance and Operations. It's written by a group of folks from Dude Solutions, um, which I knew years ago as School Dude, and also by Jeffrey Carey, a GIS coordinator in the town of Amher Andover, where I was the Deputy Director of Public Works and Highway Superintendent. So, as most of you know, technology has completely uh, flipped our operations on their heads. We operate today with phones and iPads and computers. Our, a lot of our software is mobile. And it's really changed the way we do business. Uh, you know, if there's a blocked catch basin, we know now, uh, not at the end of the day or tomorrow, we know on our phone in about 10 seconds after the calls come in and um, we're expected to react. So we wanted to talk about modern technology and all the changes and the benefits uh, of how that can help us do our jobs more effectively and provide better service. So we looked at the benefits of a CMMS, how to choose a CMMS, how you make your maintenance operations mobile and have that technology um, be easily used in the field, the what and why of GIS, uh, what GIS software looks like today, uh, what are some opportunities for real world mobile GIS applications in higher education, and we did a case study on GIS success for Concordia University, which uh, Dude Solutions folks did. Next, please. So um, I'm a little biased on this one. Uh, this is a, a chapter that I've written both for the second edition and the third edition. And it's something that I think is incredibly important. Um, in our grounds operations, we use so much fuel uh, and so many resources that it really uh, behooves us to figure out ways to reduce our environmental footprint. And, so this chapter that I wrote uh, with a with a bunch cooperation of a bunch of different people from different companies and different organizations um, looks at sustainable vehicles, equipment, fuels, and lubricant. Today, uh, as opposed to you know 
uh, eight years ago. There are many more viable, more affordable, and easily obtainable options on the ground. Um, and so in this chapter, we look at a lot of those and give you practical real world examples. We talk about hybrid electric vehicles. We talk about plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. We talk about battery electric vehicles. We speak about mild, full, parallel, and series hybrids. Um, one, of the things that I, one of the things that I'm most excited about is vehicle hybridization options uh, for the medium range uh, vehicles, medium uh, duty and medium weight vehicles, things like vans, uh, pickup trucks, and other medium duty vehicles. Um, there's an organization just outside Boston called XL Fleet, and they offer a hybrid op uh, uh, option that um, improves the fuel efficiency of vehicles by about 25%. And it's really amazing what you can do with your F-250s and some of the transit vans uh, when there are really no other options to save fuel in that uh, sec section of the, our fleets. So that's a real uh, exciting company and an exciting option to be able to look at. We sp speak about compressed natural gas vehicles and other alternative fuel vehicles. And we look at a case study at the University of New Hampshire in Durham uh, and their facilities and transportation services department, which has done amazing work throughout their, uh, throughout their sector, throughout the transportation sector with trucks, cars, buses, and other um, uh, options in their fleet. Next, please. And to continue on with that chapter, uh, uh, another option we can look at, uh, which is um, pretty exciting also, is uh, John Deere makes a hybrid loader now that uh, does something similar to what we were talking about with the XL hybrid fleet. You save about 20 or 25% in the fuel. Uh, you, you retain the power or get more power, and the vehicles are incredibly quiet. So um, we have a little case study that looks at Boston DPW and the John Deere 644 hybrid wheel loader. Um, hybrid lifts are amazing now. There are a lot of organizations looking at hybrid lifts um, rather than bucket trucks. And we look at a, a case study on Arnold Arboretum, uh, and they have a hybrid lift there, an AMI hybrid lift that'll reach uh, over 90 feet and um, is uh, electric, uh, as an electric option, which um, makes it much quieter, saves fuel, and the lift can get into spaces as narrow as three or four feet. So they can really get into places that are difficult into that, uh, in that collection that's um, really a unique collection. Um, another one is uh, we look at grounds equipment and the new, whole new series of battery powered mowers and chainsaws and string trimmers and pole saws and blowers that are out on the market now that um, have lithium ion batteries, long life and uh, are quieter and much more safe and uh, convenient and actually efficient uh, in our grounds operations. So we look at the use of those, that kind of equipment at both the Medical University of South Carolina and the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where I came from. And then we look at some green lubri lubricants as well. Next, per next slide, please. And now we're going to turn, I'm going to turn it back over to Brandon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so this chapter, uh, Broadcast Maintenance versus Zone ma Maintenance, uh, is written by me. Uh, so, of course, I really like this chapter. <laughs> and just to uh, uh, go over what is broadcast versus zone maintenance. Right? So broadcast maintenance is um, just kind of everybody does everything across the entire university. Um, and this works well in some certain situations and others it doesn't. A lot of um, like landscape vendors will run their operation as a broadcast maintenance. Some, maybe you have a group of mowers and they do all the mowing, and you have a group of detailers and they do all the detailing, et cetera. Um, but some places find it more beneficial to do zone maintenance where uh, you might break up each area of campus or each area of a facility into certain zones and everybody's responsible for um, that zone in particular. It's similar to custodial team clean, um, that type of thing. Um, and in this chapter, kind of it goes over the, the struggles uh, that you might run into and the financial decisions. You know, sometimes broadcast can be more expensive with purchase, and it goes into the nuts and bolts of that. And uh, a bulk of the chapter is a case study um, that we did here at University of Chicago. Uh, so when I started in 2010, they were doing um, broadcast maintenance, and we were 
kind of struggling with um, some accountability issues and people a lot of calling off and it just there wasn't a good cohesive group because everybody kind of just assumed everybody else would pick up their slack. Um, so we switched to zone maintenance uh, to try it out in uh, mid 2010. And this, uh, a lot of campuses already kind of, campuses and areas, facilities already broken into these zones. So we just used the campus map. We didn't create this, uh, but luckily you're kind of able to kind of work loading within those certain areas. For example, you know, A and B, the way those are, you're going to have to look at uh, from a landscape, um, how much landscape maintenance is needed. So A and B, each of those might only take one person, whereas D, which is our central main quad of campus, there's three people in there. Uh, so the case study kind of goes into how we decided to break people up and the, the politics that go with it within, uh, you know, the inner, inner crew workings. And the next chapter uh, is Green Roof Technologies, uh, written by Mike Selleck, uh, no relation to Tom Selleck, unfortunately. And he works for Live Roof, Live Roof which is a modular trace system, but the, the chapter goes over all of green roofs, not just his product, obviously. Uh, it's some of the benefits such as uh, heating and cooling, uh, the, the benefits of that insulation, um, vegetation plant selection, uh, which I'll go into in the next slide, uh, the maintenance or uh, not necessarily much maintenance and the public incentives you can get, not so much in Illinois, but um, some um, maybe more progressive areas from an environmental stance uh, kind of, credits and lead credits, that type of thing. So uh, just to go into green roofs a little bit, there's, there's three different types for the most part. Uh, extensive green roof on the, the left there is your basic green roof, either tray or built up system. Uh, you're gonna run into your sedums, herbs, that type of thing. Low maintenance, doesn't need irrigation. This is the green roof I would recommend to everybody. It's stupid simple, very, very easy but it just goes on top of the building. There's not much interaction. Whereas if you're gonna have people up there or it's gonna be very, um, from an aesthetic point, it's gonna be very prominent. You know, Maybe it's an inner garden within a building that has levels that are gonna look onto this. There's other types. So that semi-intensive built up a little more, uh, is gonna need more weeding, whereas the sedum on the, you know, the extensive green roof is gonna grow in very tight, not allow very many weeds. The next level up, the semi-intensive, you're gonna need to do a little more maintenance. And then the next one, intensive green roof, which you might see on, you know, some, some hotels, resorts, or uh, office complexes where it's not just used as uh, a roof, it's actually an interactive part of that building. You're going to have your trees, shrubs, that type of thing. It's basically a landscape that's elevated um, in there. The next chapter by Chelsea Abbott, who's with uh, the Davy Institute. They're all over, but she happens to be based out of uh, Chicago here. Uh, she kind of talks about several things. Uh, the disease triangle on the right here you see is, you know, for a disease to actually take hold, you need the host, you need the environment, you need the pathogen for that disease to uh, strive. And then within that, so she touches on uh, quite a few diseases and pests that are uh, becoming a real problem within the, the United States. The Dutch elm disease, which I'm sure most people are fairly familiar with, chestnut blight, sudden oak death, and uh, our favorite, emerald ash borer, which is wreaking havoc here on the, uh, the Midwest, along with Japanese beetle and the kudzu vine. So a little bit about the emerald ash borer. Uh, you see the little green guy on the left there, that's the emerald ash borer. And the middle photo shows where that insect burrows into the tree. You can see the D-shaped hole, which is kind of the, the, the prominent, you know, you have emerald ash borer, that's a good sign is that this that D-shaped hole. And then on the right is basically after that tree's already passed the uh, point of no return there. Uh, you see that, that tunneling from the bore once they get into there and eating the, um, the tree there. So it, it goes into how we can, treat, this chapter kind of goes into, uh, you know, proactively treating for emerald ash borer along with the other, um, other pests there. Integrated pest management chapter by uh, Dennis Schwartzel out of uh, Las Vegas. So uh, just a brief overview on IPM or integrated pest management, uh, more or less without saying too much on it is basically taking in all considerations rather than just treating the pest. So treating the pest without chemical, using chemicals as a last resort. So um, taking into account aesthetic thresholds, if you don't, if the pest isn't gonna completely kill the tree. For example, 
uh, Japanese beetle. Sometimes you're going to get defoliated by a Japanese beetle. Uh, does it make sense to, to spray that entire tree and waste the product uh, both uh, from a financial and environmental stance? Or do you have, is that tree healthy enough that it can take one of those uh, defoliations? And the different types of um, control, like, like uh, biological control, cultural practice, maybe you, from a turf stance, maybe rather than uh, spraying for weeds, you raise the height of cut on your turf a little bit. Chemical control, obviously. And genetics using, uh, uh, for lack of better words, like a GMO type product um, that is more resistant to certain diseases and pests. Um, and on the right there, you see the, the mistletoe and that mesquite tree uh, that is a parasite, along with the lantern fly from Asia. The, the leadership chapter is from Jeff McManus uh, from Ole Miss. You may have seen his uh, book, uh, the Growing Leaders, Weeders into Leaders. Uh, it's fairly well known, uh, both within uh, the grounds industry as well as facilities as a whole. So his whole chapter, it, it's a, a great read, kind of goes by how he, when he took over at Ole Miss, kind of his practices, uh, the kind of the leadership that he um, ingrained within his staff and all through there. So Natural Grass Athletic Fields by Patrick McGuire, uh, consultant out of Massachusetts. Um, obviously, you kind of have an idea of what this uh, chapter is about. This is uh, a meaty chapter. Uh, so just real quick, uh, the different types of fields. So you have natural grass field types, um, just with you know, native to the area. For example, you know in the Midwest we're probably using some some bluegrass or some cool season grass, something like that. Whereas you get a little bit further south and or in the transition zone, you're looking at Bermuda grass and uh, seashore pest and that type of thing. Uh, it goes into that. And then native soil fields versus amended versus sand cap. So native soil fields is basically any field where you're just going to have what what you have, what whatever lies, lies. And then where you have the amended, maybe you're working in some type of product into that soil to help help drainage or or help water retention, that type of thing. And then the sand cap field, which is exactly how it sounds, uh, just a cap of sand, 10 to 14 inches of sand uh, to help help drainage, help root growth, that type of thing. And then you get into a little more complicated thing you're really not going to see very often, um, at least in general applications, the, the sand-based root zone. So um, football fields, uh, you know, NFL football fields, I'm sure some collegiate football fields, certainly not U Chicago. Um, USGA greens, where it's sand-based, maybe there's a little bit of amendment in there, um, but for the most part, it's for drainage and very high performance areas. Uh, out, of, out of Purdue is called prescription athletic turf back in the, I believe like the 50s, 60s where it was sand based field and then they had drainage tiles running through it and then they pumped on either end. You could suck the water out of it. Um, not necessarily still used, but um, at least in that application. And then hybrid natural grass systems. So hybrid natural grass kind of I'll go into the, in the, the next slide a little bit, kind of a mixture of um, both. So quickly, so through uh, different types of grass, cool season, warm season. Um, like I said before, the cool season, typically what you're gonna see is uh, kind of call it the Mason-Dixon line all the way across the United States, or at least till the West, uh, it's called the transition zone where the kind of cool season meets the warm season, St. Louis East and West, if you will. Um, so that's kind of the gray area, but North of there you're typically seeing cool season, South there you're typically seeing warm season. Um, and seed sprig or sod, so, uh, it depends on what you're looking to do. The, the chapter goes into what's the benefits of each, but in certain situations, um, so some hybrid Bermudas and hybrid grasses that when they go to seed, that hybrid doesn't stay with the, the genetic lineage, if you will. So you have to sprig. They basically take grass and chop it up with a, a wood chipper in a way, and then you you uh, spread the sprigs onto the uh, prepared field to make it grow. Whereas sod, you're cutting it off and laying it down like carpet. Uh, more expensive, obviously. That goes into uh, irrigation, the, the, the field maintenance. Um, as you see on the right here, a verted drain or a deep tiner, just a, a non-impactful uh, aeration rather than core aeration where you're pulling cores and disrupting play. This can kind of get you through some uh, some bad spells where you're just trying to get some compaction out of the field. Chapter goes into that, obviously. And then the synthetic turf system, 
chapter by Scott Stevens out of Elon, from North Carolina. Uh, kind of, it gives a bit of a history of the nest, uh, the field turf systems or synthetic turf systems from the, the you know the days of the 70s, where it was basically indoor outdoor carpet. Players got hurt a lot, all the way through the the crumb rubber field turf fields that uh, super soft, super playable. And then uh, the different types of fibers. So in this photo, you see on the, the left, the monofilament on the right. So most are using the one on the left. And uh, it's just a photo of, uh, in the seams, how they seam uh, the, the panels or the strips together. Uh, there's different processes. There's three or four different ways. Uh, it kind of goes into the cost difference of that. And here we see uh, the infill option. So the, I actually just looked it up today, again, and there's a new article uh, from the, the, the government actually did research. If you know, a few years ago, there was a, a big to do if, if the, the crumb rubber you see here, the black, uh, the recycled tires, if it was a carcinogen, if some children should be playing it as, along with adults, but it kind of started at the, uh, the, the grade school level, if it was a concern. And there's been a lot of research done and it's still, uh, it's kind of saying no, but it's inconclusive because nobody wants to say absolutely there's no issues. Uh, but if there's, Plenty of alternatives if you don't want to use the recycled tires. Uh, some of them here, that's coconut fiber. Uh, you can use these are obviously a little more costly. And then in the middle there's cork. Uh, we have a field that we just recently built that's on a K through 12, uh, a, a field for a K through 12 school on campus. Uh, they had the similar concerns with the crumb rubber. So what they choose, chose to go with, rather than the cork, which can have some issues with floating away, it's a little more maintenance heavy a little more expensive. Uh, they take running shoes and when they grind the, uh, the, the, the pattern in the bottom of the shoe, uh, they, they just have the, the rubber filings and they take those, they process them a bit, similar to crumb rubber, but rather than recycled tires, it's shoe rubber. So a little safer, hypothetically. <laughs> um, so it, this, uh, the synthetic turf also goes into the maintenance, which it's fairly maintenance free com as compared to a, a you know, a, grass field, but there's still maintenance that needs to be done. For example, this is the, the field turf maintenance log. If you get a field, you know, it can, field turf is kind of the main player, but certainly there's others. It just kind of gives a, a rough overview of um, what needs to be done. As you can see, brushing, aerating, raking, sweeping, and there's additional maintenance. You know, if you have to take gum off or bio spill, something like that is obviously going to need more uh, work. But this is the sheet from field turf you actually now, to keep the warranty, you have to send that in every year or you risk losing your warranty, FYI. And there's a kind of a homemade device for uh, dispersing uh, the crumb rubber or whatever infill you have. So snow and ice operations, uh, very uh, applicable to right now. It's going on out east, northeast. Uh, so Matt Bailey and Josh Ridner out of Michigan State University. Let's see, uh, goes into the... It, all encompassing holistic chapter on you know the strategies how you can coordinate with campus customers and partners the police the fire department that type of thing um, the equipment both what they have and uh, the next slide kind of show up um, kind of the capital planning for the equipment for snow removal uh, also the training communication and kind of how you can benchmark your snow removal um, operations so here you see kind of the balancing the route through GIS um, so Michigan State does their uh, their actual their inner roads and uh, sidewalks as well. So trying to use GIS to balance um, who's doing what, that type of thing, using technology to make it uh, more efficient and more fair with staff. And, and there you see the uh, kind of the capital expenditures um, spreadsheet that I was talking about. It's normal with hard on vehicles. It's it's you know if you're just talking about you know utility vehicles that are traveling from point A to point B, maybe you get 3,500 hours out of them. Whereas you got a piece of equipment that's um, hauling salt, spreading salt, moving snow and in inclement weather, you're probably not gonna see those hours. And that's something um, just through experience and kind of tracking this, uh, you're gonna get a little better at. As far as training staff, so Michigan State has a, I don't know what if they call it, a snow derby or something like that, I'm blanking on the name, I apologize. Uh, we're kind of everybody hooking up implements, getting their vehicles ready, how to operate everything. And this is just one um, one photo that they use for their for their training. All right. So staffing guidelines. 
is, is that hasn't changed from the last book much. It was updated slightly, uh, but PGMS and those, the workloading hasn't changed. Um, so we chose not to change it. Uh, there is a new matrix that is, is on the next slide we'll show, as well as uh, a case study by Tom, Tom Becker with uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, University. It's actually available on their website as well. And not the case study, but how they kind of use the staffing guidelines for workloading across their university. It's, um, it's really interesting. So here's the, the matrix. You can see uh, everybody kind of talks to the levels of attention. So one through five, five being the lead, one being, you know, primo, uh, top of the top end. So what we kind of did is uh, kind of made it in line with the other books. So it's a little easier to read, uh, easier to follow, um, that type of thing. And the case study goes into using this uh, matrix and how they divided areas on campus into you know one through five or two through four however they have it um, and why they did that so uh, Russell Bray from Calvin University uh, so contracting for equipment and services goes into uh, how you kind of uh, benchmark what you have existing and what you might need to contract uh, both from a manpower and equipment base um, and how weigh the benefits of that also, uh, issues that they ran into, Calvin, uh, for challenges for what they had to go through with the, uh, the outsourcing. Tommy Fala from Clemson University did the chapter on the position description, uh, which, just like it sounds, pretty uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, for each job within the grounds industry, what their description's um, going to read, both from job summary all the way through a, a sample position description. So here we have. Um, obviously, this is on the right. You kind of have what they would consider each. Obviously, director level, um, maybe outside of grounds, maybe they have other stuff with the, in them, but the entry level, et cetera. And on the left, you have um, a description and how they do it with grounds. So you see uh, small engine, large equipment, pesticide application, training, you know, training other staff, more senior position, and then weather related cleanup and event support. So snow. As, as much snow as they get in South Carolina, um, and then system with storms and special events. And the last chapter by uh, James Spangler and uh, Joe Jackson, used to be at Duke University, kind of, uh, I, would, I would call it like the benchmarking chapter, I guess, just the maintenance, innovation, and improvement. So the chapter deals with uh, the Baldridge Award and the PGMS Award, uh, which is the and the accreditation program. Um, also, the, the the bulk of the chapters benchmarking how you can benchmark uh, both uh, via your uh, versus your peers as well as uh, internally and how you can uh, improve that. All right, and uh, so the expected publication date is 2020. All three books, I believe, will be published at the same time. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar, and if anybody has any questions, we are here for at least another 22 minutes. We have lots of questions All right. uh, coming in. Relative to CMMS, are most campus ground teams used, used to the same CM, do they use the same CMMS? that is used for general building maintenance, or do they typically use an independent CMMS that has been designed primarily for grounds operations? I, well, the, what I'm familiar with is, so we are on Maximo, and that we use the same exact um, platform and handheld that everybody else, every other facilities group on campus uses. Uh, we're all on the same thing. I don't know if Mark is familiar. I know he's more familiar with school dudes. So maybe he's used to something a little different. So, no. So I think um, you're right, Brandon. At most schools use a CMMS program that encompasses all the departments on campus. So it's seamless and they can communicate back and forth between departments. So it would not be just tailored to grounds. You know, the only situation I could see is if you had a campus that where there was a really forward thinking grounds manager that wanted to use technology and other folks didn't, they might just use it for grounds, but most of the programs are tailored to, you know, whole facility operations. Okay, thank you. Next question is, is there a cost variance for sustainable vehicle and equipment versus traditional vehicle and vehicles and equipment? 
there is, um, so your upfront cost is probably a little more in most cases, although many states and organizations now offer grants for the incremental cost above standard equipment for the environmental options. But if you look at your life cycle costs and you look at the environmental advantages, long-term over the life of the equipment, it actually costs organizations less, especially if you roll in carbon impacts and also health benefits for employees. Uh, so in the case of XL hybrids, some of their upgrades were about $10,000 for an upgrade between eight and $10,000. But the state of Massachusetts, for instance, was offering grants from uh, their Department of en uh, Energy Resources and through uh, some through the Department of Environmental Protection for that incremental cost above. So you could either get into it for the same price or for a short amount of money that was greater um, and reap all the environmental and financial benefits down the road because you're looking at um, not only uh, environmental benefits but fuel cost savings over the life of the equipment. Yeah, and also just to tack on, uh, the, I reached out to the Hybrid XL just because we we're interested in doing something here uh, at the university. And the, the cost for us, at least on just a quick turn, it's going to need to be a long, if, if when we ever do choose to go that route, Illinois does not offer any grants. Uh, you said, you know, at some point they did, but they've taken away. So it's kind of something, at least in our area, kind of ebbs and flows. So it may be kind of targeting those. All right. Okay, our next one. In my experience, green roofs have been a poor connotation, such as they are maintenance. There are maintenance concerns due to coverage of the roof, which is a ma major building envelope. Is this being addressed or marketed in a different way to ease people's concern about maintaining the building envelope? It, yeah, I mean, maybe Mark can offer more insight, but um, in the time here is a the university here we have extensive green roof or you know, quite a few green roofs just because the city of chicago demands it from a, a water management stance and they've we haven't had any issues i'm sure there's come you know envelope you know if you have to tear the roof up but a lot of the roofs are such uh, a supposedly long le uh, lifespan and they're typically only going on new buildings or renovated buildings that hopefully should have a a, a new roof uh, that it shouldn't be an issue, um, but that with that being said, there's also the tray systems. Uh, if you're worried about that, where you can pull individual trays if there was a leak, or I mean, certainly if you have to redo the whole roof, it's got to come off. But that's kind of the, the cost of doing business in a way. Yeah, and I agree. Um, if you go with this, like you talked about earlier, Brandon, if you go with the simpler system. Um, those have proven to be a real maintenance advantage um, from an environmental point of view and actually sometimes from a, from a long-term maintenance point of view because you don't get the, the solar degradation you know, that, uh, that you would get from a regular roof and they've proven to be really effective and low maintenance, especially you know, when you're using sedums and if you have a section of the roof that happens to fail for a reason, you can just remove that tray system and replace it. Thank you. What does GROW Leadership Success stand for again? I would have to look it up, Billy. I apologize. I don't have it in front of me. All right. I'll sit. So hold on. That's um, Jeff McManus's. Uh, Jeff McManus's uh, program that he's talked about both in his book and in the chapter. And if you give me a second, I'm trying to flip back to that because I don't have it memorized. Um, so it's um, greatness, resiliency, opportunity, and wisdom. Those are the things that he talks about in the book, uh, trying to instill in um, staffs at organizations. So that's what that stands for. And it builds great leaders. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question is, when do you expect this edition to be available for purchase? Probably, I think Billy and, and um, App is still working on this, probably sometime next summer. Um, sometime in 2020, but we're hoping sometime um, 
mid to late summer. Does that sound right, Brandon? Yeah, I, be I believe so. I think uh, originally, yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know if there's a hard date, but here, uh, summer or later, is my understanding. We have another question. Is there a chapter on waste management in, in this new uh, version? There is not. Okay. Where do you get your grounds requirements for NCAA standards? Do the coaches provide those or is there an NCAA standard available? As far as a measurement, that type of thing, I guess, what's the context of the question? Okay. Uh, if John would put that in, we'll, we'll come back to it. Yeah, we can follow up offline too, if that's yes. easier. That might be easier as an, as an email. Okay. Is there ROI information of traditional gas powered mowing equipment versus the trend to battery operated? Uh, there are, and the individual vendors have been working on those. So if you look at a, a particular technology like XL Hybrid, for instance, um, they will have those ROIs available. Uh, in Massachusetts, there have also been state agencies cooperating with a lot of the vendors to build those ROIs. And the same thing to, when looking at, same thing occurs when looking at grounds equipment that's now battery operated. Uh, so the answer is yes, but you have to look at the individual technologies and look at the individual vendors, and they'll normally have those. Okay, I have a, another question here. What are the advantages, disadvantages of rotating ground staff through the responsibility versus dedicated staffing? Yeah, I mean, you if you're, uh, you avoid burnout or, you know, job boredom, I guess, in that sense. So, and cross training, uh, certainly. So, I think if, to expand on that a bit, so that was one thing we were concerned about with going to from broadcast to zone maintenance uh, was is this person going to get bored not you know rotating or changing jobs on a yearly basis as they used to, uh, but we found that there's enough going on within that individual zone that they um, both they, they're getting enough to not get bored, um, and certainly there's been instances several instances where people kind of just get in a rut and they want to get out of their zone into something else and we're happy to oblige people. People love moving around because everybody thinks everybody else's area is easier. Um, so we kind of have change in that way as well to try to relieve the, you know, job boredom. Okay. We are no longer allowed to use chemicals for grounds. Do you have a list of working organic herbicides? Uh, I, I can certainly email a list, a uh, fairly small list. So uh, we use a great product called Fidura, which is a non-selective. So it's basically Roundup. Um, and that's kind of what a lot of the organic or non-chemical um, pesticides or herbicides are. It, there's not really a good, for at least for spraying in the turf or insect control, that's a little tougher, but from a, a Roundup, which is kind of the a hot button item right now with all the stuff in the news about cancer and um, you know lawsuits and that, uh, the product, there's several products. Fidura is just one of them. It's clove oil and citric acid essentially. And it's, it does a great job with the understanding that it, you have to treat it as Roundup. You can't spray it into, into uh, anything it hits, it's gonna control. But I can, I, I'm happy to send some, some literature to whoever requested that. Okay. Are green roofs a growing growing trend in higher education? Uh, I can't speak to higher ed as a whole, but certainly in the Chicago land area. Um, but we're kind of, I don't want to say forced because that makes it sound aggressive. We are inclined to use them for stormwater issues. Uh, maybe Mark can uh, kind of comment. He's on the East Coast, so he has a you know bigger spread. Yeah, they are. We're seeing them used more and more, you know, the storm water issues um, with NIPTES phase two, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, federal law, 
Um, it's um, helping many organizations and companies comply with NIPTES uh, regulations. So we're seeing them being used more and more and the technology gets better and better and we're seeing more and more plants be selected that survive in those roof systems. What are the pros and cons of natural grass versus synthetic, gra synthetic grass in decorative non-athletic areas? So, uh, so we have a, a, uh, an area on campus that's high traffic. It's actually uh, a playground, a very, uh, it, you know, we're in an urban environment here in the city of Chicago. So it's, uh, like, call it elementary school, K through, K through five. And it's a, a fairly small area and they had natural turf and there's just too much foot traffic. And they ended up having to switch to, we tried the uh, synthetic turf and it was great. The only problem that we've had, it, it takes foot traffic and you almost treat it as kind of a, a soft hardscape. Like it's not gonna be grass with the understanding that anything we did grass wouldn't live there. Um, so it's, it's soft, kids fall on it, it takes that. The only problem we found is it gets pretty hot as compared to um, natural turf, which is definitely a con. Uh, even if you try to spray it down, syringe it down to try to cool it off, uh, it doesn't really react like natural turf when you try that and end up just kind of making like a humid, hot mess in a way. Uh, but as far as pros, certain, I mean, there's pros, uh, it's probably be easier just to kind of list them out if you want an email, but uh, you know, cost is certainly a con as well, especially in a small area, you're not going to get, um, you know, a large football field, certainly per square foot, the cost is going to drop dramatically as compared to like a hundred square foot, you know, decorative area. Yeah, and in Andover, one of those um, opportunities we were looking at, and uh, before I retired, we still hadn't done it, but we were looking at it, was at an elementary school, there was a field next to the school that was used both for athletic activities and also for recess for the school. So the field never got rested at all. So it became a prime opportunity to use something like a cork-based uh, cork based infill synthetic field where you'd still have, you know, an environmentally um, positive field. You know, you won't have crumb rubber issues. Um, and uh, we'd have longer play time and less maintenance issues with it. So that was a really good opportunity, we thought, to use the cork-based uh, synthetic field. Okay, and I have a request for you to go back to your contact information slide, please. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any staffing matrices specific to tree crews, irrigation, or landscape install crews? Uh, within the staffing guidelines that we're referencing? Yes. I would have to check if it's, uh, yeah, there is irrigation, this tree, uh, as long as uh, mowing weeding, that type of thing, I believe. I would have to double check, but I'm pretty positive. There's a, 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 large, a large spreadsheet. Okay, thank you. Question about the green roof thing with the first option that was basically herb or small plant gardens placed on the roofs. Okay. I'm not sure sure what the actual question is could you do that again um there someone is asking you for the organic product that you named it's phydura p-h-y-d-u-r-a um and i don't know i don't know if that's a a midwest thing i would assume there's similar kind of across the country and it's uh, mainly um, citric acid and clove oil. It kind of smells like clove cigarettes, which can be a little concerning um, for some people, but uh, it has super quick knockdown power. So even if we're using it in an area we, where we would uh, historically use Roundup or something like that, if there's a big event or something, we need to spray cracks in sidewalks or something like that. Uh, I mean, within an hour or two, it's completely gone, the, the, the weeds. 
Yep. Looks okay. like it's national. Is the plants on the roof herbs or what plant is used? What is the benefit of using this? Uh, so typically, for example, um, the building I work out of, it's fairly new. And we have, uh, you know, the, the what he's referencing, we have herbs and sedum. Um, so basically it's two or three different types of sedum. And just for a more decorative, there's some wild onion that's thrown in there just for some a little bit of height, just kind of break up. Uh, it's a very large green roof, just to kind of break it up a little bit so it's not as monoplane. Um, so that when it herbs, that it's not necessarily, you know, you're not growing basil and child, you know, basil and mint or something and harvesting it. It, it herbs more from decorative rather than eating it, I guess. Okay. Thank you. In an urban setting, what are your recommendations to deal with unwanted pests? What kind of pests? Uh, rats. I, I don't know. Rats. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I mean, obviously, in an urban environment, they're going to be everywhere. Um, what we kind of run into, at least from speaking solely from grounds. Um, in which a lot of trash and recycling falls underground, um, just making sure trash and recycling is taken care of, as well as uh, you're always going to have them in the dining halls, cafes, that type of thing. We, we're on a pretty um, robust pest control, preventative pest control um, program here. Uh, also, we're having a lot of push, which I'm sure um, a lot of places are, uh, staff, faculty, students want to um, kind of make edible gardens. Uh, we have several on campus. Uh, you know, everybody gets really excited to plant them and they want to, you know, they water them for a couple of weeks. And then, sure enough, uh, the summer starts and everybody goes off campus and all the edible gardens are now left to rot and wither away, which attracts pests, et cetera. So, what we try to do is if somebody does want a garden, they're far away from cafes, dining halls where we're trying to keep pests away from, from a sanitary stance, as well as being very proactive with these either gardens or anything just trying to make sure people stay on top of being clean if you have any apple trees cherry trees on campus you got to be really diligent about cleaning those up because rats are a, a pest of opportunity so but yeah it's okay a, it's a, go ahead i'm sorry I'm sorry, I cut you off there, Brandon. If you want to finish. Uh, no, I, I, I think I was done. Sorry, I thought maybe Mark jumped okay. in. Okay. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. What type of liquid de-icer are you using and how is it performing? Oh, so <laughs> we we do not use, we try to brine like a, use a salt brine with some beet juice in it. And we found that for our application, we only do, um, we do sidewalks, docks, entries, parking lots. We don't do a lot of vehicular traffic areas. We don't do roads, city handles that, where, you know, uh, historically that's where the, the icer is gonna be most beneficial to keep it from a hard pack foreman. So we found on sidewalks, that type of thing, what we were running into is uh, the vehicles that we were using to spray it, um, were taking a, uh, getting beat up pretty bad just from the spray getting sucked up through the radiator. A lot of, uh, we use tool cats, for example, uh, kind of have a bottom radiator, so they're sucking them in. Um, it, the product worked well. And what, again, what we ran into, and I'm sure every area is different, is uh, people liked seeing the salt on the entrances and sidewalks. They knew we did something and they felt as if like there was, a, you know, they could see it, so it was working and we weren't just waiting for the snow to hit. Whereas when we did the, the liquid, you know, we'd spray it, it'd dry, and you could see it if you were looking for it. But to the untrained eye, uh, the granular traditional salt, which we use a beet juice treated salt um, anyways, it was more beneficial to us. But I know Mark has some experience with um, the liquid, so he can probably chime in here on that. You there, Mark? Yep, here we I got back. I just lost you for a second. So years ago at UMass, we used ice ban, a uh, combination of ice ban, 
back then, and we had uh, incredible success. It really helped us reduce our salt use um, and improve traction on sidewalks and roads. Um, it's a huge culture change. You have to change the types of equipment you use and the way you apply it. You have to be monitoring temperatures. But back then we used it, uh, we really liked it, uh, and it had a lot of benefits. So I urge anybody that's thinking about doing that to contact the vendors in their area that um, are interested in providing them with those kinds of de-icing agents that are natural and have them come in and do presentations. And if you need more information on that, you can uh, email Brandon or I and we can get you more information about vendors. We okay, had a lot of success well, at UMass Amherst. Sorry. Go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. So we had a lot of success at UMass Amherst, and they worked out real well. We had two zones, actually, two major landscape zones, and they kind of competed um, with each other on how to use that new technology in different ways. Okay, thank you. Well, I am. we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank everyone to take that took time out of their busy schedule to attend our webinar today. And I would like to thank our presenters, Brandon Rux and Mark Fournier for taking their time to put this presentation together. I hope everyone has a great rest of the week and a very happy holiday season coming up. Thank you so much and we'll talk again next week for our webinar next Thursday. Bye-bye now.